Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December National CCL meeting. What we do on this monthly call is broaden our perspective by hearing from a speaker, share news of our work, and get ready for action. I'm Madeline Para, your VP of Programs, and I have the privilege of hosting this meeting today while Mark Reynolds attends our board meeting. The last time I did this was in March. It was the start of the pandemic, and I remember just really clearly how emotional it was for me to be asking you to stop meeting in person. Well, as you know, we aren't out of the woods yet, so do please keep on wearing your masks and social distancing and not meeting in person until the cases have fallen way down or lots of people have been immunized. Your lives matter, and not just because we need you at CCL, so we do. So as tired as we are, all of the pandemic, let's just notice how much we've gained by developing our capacity to work virtually. I hope you'll take time in your chapter Zoom meetings to appreciate the things you've learned to do during the pandemic. For example, we've put on some really great conferences on Zoom. Approximately 5,010 climate activists joined our December conference, 3,725 on Zoom and roughly 1,285 via the live streams on social media. Well, we can't do that at the Omni Hotel in DC. It's not big enough. And every breakout I went to last Saturday was well run and engaging. So back in the summer, uh, when we were planning the June conference and we were still learning how to do it, the staff decided then just to not try to have state breakouts or an action team fair as part of that June conference. I mean, it would have been crazy to run 40 or 50 simultaneous Zoom meetings as part of a conference, right? And do it not just once, but twice during the conference. But then this fall, we decided that you were ready for that. And we added it to the program last weekend because so many of you had learned to work well on Zoom. And who else but CCL volunteers and staff working together would attempt such a crazy thing. I wanna give a shout out uh, really to all the action team leaders and state coordinators who made this work. I know you put a lot of effort into practicing for those sessions and your work truly enhanced the conference. We also just finished our second virtual lobby week during the pandemic and volunteers have held or scheduled 375 meetings with congressional offices. About 25% of those meetings were scheduled to be face-to-face -face with the member of Congress. And as you've probably heard, three new members of Congress have already committed to sign on as co-sponsors of the Energy Innovation Act from your lobbying. It's also been a big month for fundraising. As you know, we only ask for donations for the national organization twice a year, in the spring and at the end of the year. Well, in March, when the pandemic hit, <clears throat> it just totally shut down our spring fundraiser because everyone was just too worried about the pandemic and the economy. So it's really a great delight to me to report that we and you bounced back for our year-end fundraiser. We set an audacious goal of $1 million and we're well over halfway there. With two weeks left to give, we have 398,000 left to go, but I'm confident we'll make it. And reaching that goal will give us the resources that we need to organize more people faster and hit the ground running in 2021. I don't know about you, but I'm really ready to hit the ground running in 2021. So thank you so much to all of you that have already donated. And also last week, we topped 2,000 prominent endorsers for HR 763 including 83 state legislators and 170 city and county elected officials. So it's been a great month and you folks have just not been stopped by really anything. I'm, I'm just blown away by what you do. Okay, so today's a very special anniversary for climate activists. It's the five-year anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And we're delighted to have the architect of that agreement, Cristiana Figueres, as our speaker. She was unable to be with us live because as you can imagine, she's in great demand today, but she wanted to be with us. And so she made a video for you. So Ms. Figueres is an internationally recognized leader on global climate change. As the executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change from 2010 to 2015, she directed successful conferences of the parties in Cancun in 2010, Durban 2011, Doha 2012, Warsaw 2013, and Lima 2014, and then culminated her efforts in the historical Paris Agreement of 2015. Ms. Figueres brought together national and subnational governments, corporations and activists, financial institutions and communities of faith, 
think tanks and technology providers, NGOs and parliamentarians to jointly deliver the unprecedented climate change agreement. For that achievement, Ms. Figueres has been credited with forging a new brand of collaborative diplomacy. Today, she's the co-founder of Global Optimism and the co-author of the recently published book, The Future We Choose, Surviving the Climate Crisis. So we're honored that Ms. Figueres took the time to share some thoughts with us. You'll notice at the outset of the video that she's extremely happy about Joe Biden winning the election and assumes you are too. Well, this is just a tiny bit tricky for us because actually all of you might not feel exactly as she does. We've worked hard to be a bipartisan organization and create a space where supporters of Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders can work jointly on our shared concern about climate change. But if you listen to Ms. Figueres from inside the world that she's lived in so well, it makes complete sense that the outcome of the US election was a huge relief to her. As someone who led the nations of the world to the Paris Agreement, she would have been dismayed, as many of you were, when the United States pulled out of it. And so naturally, she's very happy now to have us preparing to come back into it. She knows that the US role on the world stage is critical, and American leadership makes international cooperation much stronger and more effective. So let's listen to Cristiana Figueres now. Hello, friends. I am sure that we are all delighted, ecstatic, I should say, with the Biden win uh, because it allows the United States to begin to heal on so many issues, on race, on respect for each other, on gender, on democratic institutions, on climate change. Um, so I'm, I'm going to speak to you about climate, but I think we can all agree that climate is not an issue onto itself. It's actually interconnected with all of these other issues that I've just mentioned, race, inequality, economic opportunity, poverty, all these issues are actually interconnected. And that is why we are so delighted about a Biden win that wins with a very difficult challenge of bringing the country back together again. But not being a US citizen, let me not uh, stay in US policy field, but rather move to the global um, perspective on climate change. I am sure you are all aware of the fact that we are just beginning the decisive decade of the history of humankind on this planet. That is no exaggeration. It is the most decisive decade because it is precisely over this decade, the next 10 years minus 11 months, that we are going to be deciding the future of the human presence on this planet. Whether that is going to be a presence that is full of physical destruction, of ecosystem failures, and of human misery, the likes of which we have never seen, or whether we're going to open the door to a world that is not only different from the dystopia, not only avoiding the dystopia that I've just described, but rather a world that is much better than the world that we have now. A world of green, healthy, clean, non-polluted cities with clean, efficient and interconnected transport, with much better soil productivity, with regenerated um, oceans, a world that is so much better for our health and for the health of the planet. That is why it is so important that precisely at the beginning of this decade, that we have political leadership everywhere that understands that we're in this together and we're in this urgency and emergency together. Every single day counts. Every day of this decade counts, every week, every month, every year counts. So the fact that in the United States we have at least four years at the beginning of this decade to get ourselves back on track is majorly critical. Now, along these 10-year timeline, we also have much shorter term milestones. Let's remember that this year is the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the Paris Agreement. And we are expecting many countries to come forward on December 12th to register publicly or announce publicly that they have understood 
that decarbonizing their economy is good for their economies and therefore that they are moving to a higher ambition than the first tranche of, um, uh, of ambitions that they registered five years ago under the Paris Agreement because the Paris Agreement requires countries to come together every five years to increase the ambition and the aspiration of, democratize, of decarbonizing um, economies. So we are certainly hoping that there will be a number of countries that we already know include the EU, China, Korea, Japan, South Africa, and of course next year the United States will join. So a sizable number of the G7 and the G20 countries that will be moving forward with us to register then formally and officially next year at COP26 where we expect a much, much broader group of countries to do the same. Now, in the meantime, I am delighted to see that every day I see good news of corporations, one after the other that is stepping up to set their own long-term target of reaching decarbonized operations and in fact, even value chains, net zero operations by 2050, some by 2040, some even by 2030, and some corporations actually even saying it is entirely possible to be climate positive by 2030 because they understand that carbon constraint is the cradle of innovation and of efficiency. I see the same in financial sector, moving away from the high risk of high carbon assets into lower risk, low carbon assets. So those two moving together, the corporates and the financial, are actually setting the scene for what should be done by governments, which is to place a price on carbon. Because once we have a price on carbon, especially if we have a universal price, then decarbonization will happen much quicker and much easier. That is why I thank you for lobbying so staunchly for national legislation in the United States. It will, of course, still be critical even under a Biden administration, and you understand that dynamic on Capitol Hill better than I. But it is still going to be important, all of your lobbying uh, for national legislation, and please don't forget state legislation, because the United States has been moving forward thanks to forward-leaning states for the past four years that are actually the areas, the constituencies that give consistency to the democratization and the decarbonization process um, in the United States. So do not forget uh, also to work at state level. I want to thank you for not giving up over the past four years, but I also want to remind you that this is no time to let up. We didn't give up before, but now we do not let up because the future, my friends, is not written in the future. It is being written right now in the present moment, and it is being written by all of us together in every country, in every city, in every profession, in every sector. And as we are writing the future of our planet, we have to choose to actually and actively write it with optimism. And what I mean by optimism, I mean the gritty, stubborn determination to bring together all our ingenuity, all our effort, everything that we know how to do, all of our decisions to ensure that we are going to get on the right track by 2030. That's what it's going to take. This is not an easy change of tack. This is a difficult one because we have delayed it way too long, but it is entirely possible. And that is why we have to attack it with optimism, with gritty determination that this we're going to make this possible and do it stubbornly optimistic because we will have barriers, we will have all kinds of challenges that come forward and that cannot hold us back. We have to be stubborn in our gritty determination to move forward. So with that, I would like to invite you all to join a growing family 
of stubborn optimists around the world. May you continue to be stubbornly optimistic. Thanks. <laughs> Gritty determination, stubborn optimism. She is talking our language and reminding us that there are stubborn optimists around the world. We're not alone here in the US. And our message fits our action for the month, which is to plan your action priorities for next year's push to advance carbon fee and dividend legislation. The action sheet includes a two page chapter action guide that gives you a strategic overview on the first page and a list of key actions for you to develop for yourselves on the second page. And the action sheet also includes a laser talk on the European Union's pending border carbon adjustment that will go into effect in 2023. The, EU, the EU's action uh, that will help incentivize our Congress to put a price on carbon in order to avoid our businesses paying carbon fees to the European Union. So practicing the laser talk will help you be ready to use this information in your work. And since Ms. McGarris left me a little extra time today and there's been so much good work going on, I'm gonna share a few more stories and two other short videos and then give you just a little extra time for your planning meetings. So here's some more of what you've been doing during the pandemic and which you could build on as part of your strategic work next year. Let's start with Rotary. Karen Kendrick Hans has spent many years working with Rotary and achieved a key milestone last month when, uh, uh, when protecting the environment uh, was added to the official list of Rotary causes and that explicitly included climate change. Now Rotary is a place where local community leaders gather to network and if you're focusing your CCL work on grass tops outreach, you might consider joining Rotary and networking from within as Karen did. Rotary presentations, uh, those that, you know, we make a lot of those and those are wonderful, but they're one-time events. So if you can invest the time and money in ongoing relationships by joining Rotary and networking there, you may find that it pays off for your grass tops outreach work. And then there's Farm Bureau. CCL volunteers tried hard for many years to find allies within the American Farm Bureau. And like Karen and Rotary, they've persisted and times have changed. And so for the first time, we have a few local farm bureaus passing climate resolutions. If you're in an agricultural state and farm support is important, get advice from our national agriculture action team on how they're doing it. And health, who isn't thinking about health these days? The healthcare action team set a goal of getting 1000 medical professionals to sign the health professionals climate and carbon pricing declaration. And with your help, they did it. When I checked, I saw 1044 names on their spreadsheet. You can find it on the Business Climate Leaders website. We're also upping our game in our media work. And to illustrate that, we're going to watch CCL's Senior Director of Legislative Affairs, Ben Pendergrass, on the national CBS Evening News last week. While there's a lot Mr. Biden can do alone, he will need the cooperation from a sharply divided Congress to achieve even a modest amount of his $2 trillion climate agenda, especially if he wants his climate initiatives to endure. Nobody likes the, the ping pong back and forth between administrations. We saw Obama put in place regulations. We saw Trump rescind some of them. We will likely see Biden put some back in place. And that's not good for the climate, and it's not good for business or the economy. Despite the back and forth, Ben Pendergrass from the grassroots organization Citizens Climate Lobby is already seeing some progress on Capitol Hill. He says, unlike a few years ago, he no longer has conversations with lawmakers who outright deny the need for climate action. With more and more bills that have bipartisan support in the clean energy space, those things have been steadily advancing and gaining more traction. We have seen on the ground, like Republicans being much more uh, receptive to messages on climate action. Since there's not much appetite in Republican circles to limit the use of gas and oil, Pendergrass does see potential agreement on carbon capture technology. While it's expensive and not quite ready for mass implementation, the hope is that further investment would make it more viable, limiting emissions from fossil fuel facilities and sucking out carbon from the atmosphere. Science agrees carbon capture is necessary, but many argue it's just a ban mandate to avoid dealing with our addiction to fossil fuels. When I hear carbon sequestration, the first thing I think is, oh, okay, so nothing's going to get done. I mean, that's at least my reaction to it. 
I think in some ways that's understandable if we were talking about that being the only thing. But there are other ways to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, including putting a tax on carbon emissions. That means any products or services in which fossil fuels are used will cost a little bit more. This would guide society to use more affordable renewable energy sources. Pendergrass thinks there just may be some congressional interest in this. There's not an economist you will meet that doesn't prefer a carbon price over any other approach. It's efficient. Um, it gets the job done. Beyond that, Pendergrass feels there may be some agreement on infrastructure spending to support a new low carbon economy, like constructing electricity transmission lines and vehicle recharging stations. Agriculture could also play a key role in addressing the climate challenge. There may be some appetite to create markets to incentivize farmers to use their soil to sequester carbon. Above all, experts say embracing science will help re-energize the country's climate agenda. So that was um, Ben Pendergrass of CCL staff. Yes, that was the national CBS Evening News last week. So we previously shared and celebrated the amazing work you did in collaboration with the Environmental Voter Project to increase the participation of environmentally minded voters in elections. In the course of that work, many of you got over your aversion to making phone calls, which is, you know, people often don't like making them. Uh, but in, along with that work, you also developed skill in using Zoom to support phone banking. So I'm seeing something really exciting now emerging out of that experience. It's a growing use of Zoom by CCL chapters for what we're calling co-working. The basic idea is that instead of taking action by yourself alone in your house, which is often hard to do, the people make a date for getting together on Zoom so they can work individually on their commitments in the company of each other. So I've heard of CCL groups doing this, for example, to make phone calls to invite people to come back to their meeting or uh, to make phone calls to Congress together or to write letters to the editor or to work on calling or emailing the people in the community that they're working on for Grass Tops outreach. And then at the end of that co-working time, they take a few minutes to debrief and celebrate what they got done. You know, I used to just be able to go to a coffee shop with my laptop when I needed to work on something hard and it felt too isolated in my house, but I can't do that during the pan pandemic. So I think this Zoom co-working sounds pretty cool. If you wanna know more about it, join the January 7th training webinar that Brett Cease will be hosting. Okay, and then my last item in this list of wonderful things, which obviously doesn't include everything you're doing, uh, is our virtual postcards. So we needed something to replace our paper-based constituent comment letters during the pandemic. So we borrowed the idea of testimonial slides from the Higher Education Action Team and turned them into virtual postcards. A lot of you used them in your lobbying this week, collected them and sent them to your member of Congress. And they also work well as a recruitment tool or in addition to a presentation. The Madison, Wisconsin chapter used them to make a video to put out on their own local social media. But we're gonna show that to you now because the words and pictures that come from your hearts are so powerful.
Mm. Okay, looking ahead, next year we have a new Congress and a new president and new opportunities. We anticipate a quick reintroduction of the Energy Innovation Act, but we can never be sure, of course. Congress is what Congress is. But we decided it would be strategic to plan another virtual lobby week for March instead of our traditional spring lobby drive spread over two months. We also expect to lobby virtually in June, but we hope to have a big, big celebratory in-person lobby event and conference in November, assuming that we're past the pandemic. That information is also in the action sheet and we'll keep you posted as things unfold and exact dates get set. So in the meantime, stay safe, stay connected, find ways to rest and play during the holidays so that we can leave 2020 behind and move powerfully into 2021. Thanks so much for being who you are, for making it through this year and for giving me the privilege of working for and with you. See you around. Your job is to build trust with patience and understanding. Of course the climate's changing. I support the Energy Innovation Act. It is a bipartisan, common sense uh, approach to you know, solving this problem. Fighting climate change is a lot like physical training. You just have to build up for it. Congress has made steps in the right direction. But there is so much more we need to do, and we need your help to move forward.